What's on, where and when? It's the Talk of Nelson. Talk Nelson Radio. Sport. The Marco Rugby Roundup. You're with the Marco Rugby Roundup and it's time for our very special guest, Quentin McDonald, player in the Tasman Marco and coach of Central. Quentin is well known to our listeners. He's the current Tasman Marco hooker. Marco number 48 and just the third Marco to bring up 100 games. That's fantastic. More recently, however, he is the successful player coach of the 2022 Tasman Trophy Premiers, the Central Club from Marlborough. And firstly... Quinton, congratulations on the Tasman Trophy Premiership. It's a fantastic result. How special yeah, sure. is that uh, for yeah, you sure to achieve that? Sure, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it was a nice introduction. Yeah, um, it was an awesome, uh, awesome achievement for our Central Rugby Club to, uh, I mean, even for the Marlborough region, just to, I think mean, it's been nearly eight, eight, nine years since the Marlborough team, team had won it, so... So uh, slice a little bit of history for our club was awesome, and we'll, uh, we'll yeah we'll take that for a long time. Yeah, so it was Waitoi that uh, won it in 2014, but they uh, they won it as top of the table in Round and Robin. You actually got through the, uh, the the playoff series to win this trophy, so very very special. But um, Quinton, you know I watched you lose to Kaharangi in Round Three in Motueka. And, and what I observed thereafter was a real steady improvement for both your defence and attack. So basically, mate, what went on inside your team, forwards and backs, that followed that setback and led to you winning? Yeah, well, that, like you said, I think it was, um, it was a bit of a fork in the road kind of that game. I mean, to be fair, we thought we were travelling not too bad. And then to travel over to Mott, we thought we were in a good space. But we probably, like you said, we weren't nailing things that it probably showed in that performance we Definitely didn't play our best, and obviously to lose over there where we thought we were in for a good shot was uh, pretty disappointing. But I mean, that was kind of set the tone for the rest of the season. So that was always just something we could dwell back on. I mean, like you said, we started, we we prided ourselves. Like, we always got a good attack. We always know that, but it was our D in the Easter year that's kind of let us down. So we just thought if we'd, we'd work on our D, if we can, you know, obviously rugby, you don't want to let too many points in. If we can keep the point, if we can keep the points to a minimum, then we'd be in good stead. So, I mean, and from there we just had a, we just took off. I think. Yeah, I, I think your defence was amazing, so well connected and aligned. I, I, I obviously watched the semi final against Marist, and uh, you know they'd enter into your territory five, seven times, but could not score. Went away with three pointers, and that really set that uh, that went up, didn't it? The defence that day. Yeah, it did. I mean, we had a couple of good defensive efforts. I mean, during the year, we didn't lack too many points. And then when we did get tested, like you said, against Maris, uh, both times in Nelson and in Blenheim, um, we, yeah, we come up with some uh, with some good D and some uh, good turnovers. But, uh, yeah, like you said, we, we had a real good team that was just, they just wanted to, like, you know, they enjoyed that kind of thing. I mean, led by Braden Stewart, Okafi, he was our catalyst behind all that. He's a, he's a tough little bugger, so... I mean, rugby's one of those things. Have you seen your mate go for a, make a tackle? Then you obviously follow that. And we had 15 boys at a time that wanted to, you know, really commit to that, that side of the ball, which was, um, for club rugby, you don't get that too often. But, I mean, like you said, you could kind of see the rewards towards the end of it. Your set piece was also very strong. Scrums uh, and your lineouts. you know, your, your Twin Towers and Jack Powell and Matt McCormick, really vital uh, you know, and, and including a line-out steal at the, in the last play against Marist to get you into that final. So uh, you're obviously the coach, so how much time did you spend on set-piece? Yeah, like, we've, yeah, so we've been, we've been building for a couple of years, but like you said, you, our locks were outstanding this year. You had, Matt, yeah, like you said, Matt McCormick, the tight, he was the tight head lock, and old Jack Powell, the two-metre Peter, that just popped out of nowhere. So, I mean, when you got two classy locks like that, now Lucy's were, pretty, were real good as well, so... I just made it that much easier, especially in club rugby. We thought man, we're going to, if we're going to go anywhere, we need a good set piece. I mean, our scrum at the start, we had I say my brother Jesse Tessa McDonald, ex Tasman hooker. He was playing tight head prop the rest of the, the whole season because we had no props at the start. Then he, man, he was outstanding. He was mm. out for the year and he carried a lot of burden. I mean, he's only a hundred kilos, but well, I don't. There's not too many scrums where we went back, which is um, which makes life easier. And then especially, yeah, line-out is what you like. We did pride ourselves on our line-out and our line-out drive. But like you said, to get that steal, 
is something that we worked on quite hard as well, our defensive line out. We didn't want to give the uh, opposition too much clean ball. So, And I think uh, there was a bit of a gamble, especially going for it with Maris' drive, and we had a crack and managed to get it, especially in that semi-final. Yeah, no, it was it was an outstanding play. Just last thing about the, the final, you had a thousand plus people there, uh, Quinton. That must have been an ma- amazing experience to have that crowd cheering you on. And there were a lot of Kaharangi fans too, let's not uh, get that wrong, but uh, your crowd was awesome. Yeah, it was. I think, obviously, a sunny day is always going to attract some, some fans. And, um, yeah, you, like, I kind of, you kind of, during the week, we, you know, we just kind of did our thing, just we didn't change too much. But as, as the game got closer, you could kind of, like, Obviously, the phone starts. You get a few more texts, a few like good, a few more good lucks, and then, yeah, I think it, was, it did create quite a bit of a buzz, not just for Central Rugby, but I suppose for Marlborough mm. Rugby to have a um, have the final over there. And I mean, there was a few boys from different teams coming to support. And I remember when Carfi scored that try, and just in front of that the brand new uh, pavilion, there was I remember seeing his, his white Dowie jerseys, his Flores jerseys, there was uh, our jerseys, was all sorts of jerseys just cheering for the boys. So I was like. It's just kind of one of those games that brought everyone closer to, you know, just from old rugby. Hopefully we can just, you know, kick start a few things over that side of the hill. Oh, definitely. You know, you had Re- Renwick making this playoffs as well. So, yeah, good things happening in Marlborough. I, I want to get back to uh, you as a Tasma Marco player. You joined us as an 18-year-old in 2007, right? You were just a pup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you've had a, you've had some amazing coaches. You know, you, firstly you were coached by Dennis Brown, and then you were coached by Todd Blackadder, and then uh, Kieran Kane in two thousand and nine, and he was joined by Leon McDonald in two thousand and ten. So yeah. uh, y- your relationship with KK, of course, going back to Marlborough Boys College days. So I guess what, what I'm really interested in knowing what those early years were like under those coaches. Yeah, it's funny. Like you said, I have been around a while, but it even goes even further than that. I mean, I was kind of, when Tasman was just forming, it was kind of my last year of school. And obviously, around that now, some old areas, we didn't have a professional team at that time. Then you'd have to look over, you know, you'd have to go mm-hmm. to the Canterbury's, the Otago's to try and make it. But, I mean, I got pretty lucky. It was my last year of school was 06, where Tasman kind of, that's when they kick-started everything. So, I got lucky. I didn't have to go anywhere. So, I love, I love. I love being able to stay in the region, be able to play club rugby and then have a chance to make professional. But um, like you said, I've been pr- pretty much through most of the, all the coaches. I mean, Brownie was... So he got me in the academy, got me in all... Like, uh, he was the first guy there, but he was a... Um, like he'd been around a while. He's a top man. He was a hard bugger. He'd done Mulder for a while, so I'd kind of rub shoulders with him a little bit when I was younger for those uh, age-grade stuff. And then I went to Todd Blackhead and he was... Um, no, he was good as well. Like it was, and, but like you said, in that, those early years, it was still, I think Tasman was still trying to find their identity and there's still a bit of searching. And then obviously there's a bit of financial troubles, which kind of, that kind of stalled a few things. And that's when KK and KK come over and, and Weapon or Bevan Codwallader, he was, uh, he's, he'd been there for a while as well. So, but uh, yeah, like you said, I've had some awesome coaches, but uh, yeah, probably my closest relationship obviously was KK. He was, um, I had him at school. He was, I think everyone that knows he's a, he's a tough bugger, but probably one of the one of the best rugby minds I've ever come across, and it's still to date. He's uh, he knows his X's and O's, knows everything ins and outs. So, and he was tough on me. He like made yeah pushed me, especially at school as well, to um to kind of get where I get where I am today. He's always wanted me to work hard and you know not just play rugby, understand rugby as well. And then I suppose funny thing is I didn't think I'd coach, but all those lessons he's kind of taught me. He's kind of led me into, you know, never know, it could be a direction of coaching, so who knows. Well, you've, uh, it sounds like it to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Su- success yeah. in your first gig, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, mate, then 2015 came along and uh, you'd played 78 games for the Tasman Marco, including the 2013 Championship and two Premiership Finals. But then off you went to France to yeah. play for Onyak, is it? Oi, 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 they got silent X's over there, the French is uh, the top language. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my, so I, didn't, I didn't know that 2015 would be my last season. I had a, had a Blues, I was at 2016, I was at the Blues, and then obviously I was kind of, you know, I was kind of getting, oh, well, not getting on, like you said, I played a few games and I've been around, bumped around the um, Super Rugby scene a bit, three teams, and Tasman was always, the, like, you know, it was always home, so... 
and I just had a young. I was just expecting my second daughter, so it was um, it was just come at a probably it did come at the right time to uh, to you know branch out, head over to France, and you know try the try the wine and cheese over there in mm. different side of the world, and um, but, but, mate, yeah, I loved it, absolutely loved it. Mate, a hundred games, you only had four or five seasons there in France, so oh, yeah. uh, I, obviously that's a lot more rugby. So how is it different in France? It was actually I didn't even play. It was so it was I didn't even finish my fourth season. So I was three and a half. Oh. I was like yeah, just over three and a half seasons, and I played a hundred games. My last game was yeah, my last game before everyone went into lockdown was my hundredth game. Wow, so it was it was pretty hectic. Um, yeah. So my first year there, we play we were probably two, and that season was thirty games. And I think I played in maybe twenty seven, twenty six games. Wow. Yeah, and then the last, and then the couple after that, we were uh, top fourteen, which is obviously that's you play your challenge cups and that, and that's I think that might have been a thirty four, thirty five game year, and I don't I don't miss too many, so I don't know if that was just good luck or and yeah, so they, I think they got their money's worth, that's for sure. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. the sounds of it, is that midweek games as well? I mean, is no, it, no, no. So it'll be it'll be week, so just long was, season. Uh, how they had it set up, you'd play like fifteen games till Christmas. You'd have a big break, and then you'd have 15 games after Christmas. Wow! So it was, uh, yeah, a pretty, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, big, big old seasons, but but I mean, I com- suppose, yeah, c- coming from Marlborough to France, I mean, what was that experience like for you, and especially with your young family? Oh, uh, it was, um, oh, I suppose, yeah, it probably made it a little bit easier. I mean, it, it was obviously having a young family. I, my, I just had my second, and she, so she was just a newborn, and. My oldest one, she was one and a half, two. So, I mean, yeah, it was uh, it was an awesome experience. We had a good group. There was a good group of foreigners there, which made it that much easier. But um, I think it was just awesome. like we wanted to travel and we wanted to just do things before, you know, before yeah. things, before, like when we, like while we had the opportunity. So, I mean, going over there was pretty, it was pretty daunting, obviously going to a country, not knowing the language and, um, Obviously, away from your family, especially with two uh, younger kids. Um, but the sport we got there was awesome. We had an awesome bunch of, uh, we had an awesome group, and it just made it made it that much easier. At least you would compare notes on the wine industry, so there'd be plenty in common there. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, Marlborough, I'm a Marlborough, I like the Sauvignon Blanc and stuff, <laughs> yeah. so that was a bit, they were like, I remember taking couples to over, uh, yeah, I made the mistake, I found a couple in one of the wine bars, a couple of Marlborough uh, wines, and they were like, yeah, if you know the French, they're not ones to uh, <laughs> mince their words when it comes to their the deep reds and Bordeaux reds and whatnot. So they, yeah, yeah. they didn't come to, uh, they didn't like it too much. But no, it was an awesome experience. I mean, playing rugby, uh, playing like a lot of rugby over there, it did take its toll. But it was, I mean, we'd, we would play like we'd play like five games in a row, and then we'd get a week off. So wow, I mean. Yeah, and over there, obviously, you know, the, you, I'm an hour and a half when you're in Portugal, you're in Spain, you're in all, all sorts. So that's yeah. probably the one one of the biggest things I miss, especially looking over there now in the UK, and it's like what 40 degrees. <laughs> yes, so, that's right. And we're just and we're in, ready for a preseason game, and I don't know if we'll get over five degrees. So <laughs> yeah. It's a bit different. So, so Quentin, uh, you came back. I'm sure the McDonald clan welcomed you with open arms, but and then you got back here 2020 for that season which was a premiership season for Tasman, uh, and you played again last year and brought up your 100 games against Waikato in the final. Uh, so I'm just interested, any any differences, any noticeable changes in, in the team environment between when you left 2015 and coming back in 2020? Uh, oh, yeah, obviously there was... Um, I think we did start to build a good rapport towards those... I mean, obviously we won in 2013... And I think we started to have that little, that added bit of professionalism from that 2014, 2015 season. And then, like you said, I mean, it, like four, I was gone four or five season, and it went just like that. But I remember when I was coming in, I was pretty nervous because I was like, there was a couple of faces that were still there, but you know, there wasn't like obviously the coaches were the boys I played with, and then some of the boys, you know, had seen that the year before that 2019 year where they were, you know, unstoppable. So. I mean, being an older boy coming in, I was a little, I was pretty nervous. But I remember talking to Joey probably a couple of days before I, Joe Wheeler before I come in. He's like, mate, because he was there the year before. He's like, mate, like the face has changed, but the environment's just still the same. I was like, oh yeah. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, you'll 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 realise. And then once I got in there, it was just like, yeah. It honestly, felt like I just haven't left. The faces were different, but 
you know, the culture was created, the, the the atmosphere, the vibe, and just, you know, the fizz was always was still there. So I think that's something that you don't, you know, once you know the environment, that it's, uh, it's pretty special. So, so yeah, it was awesome to get back. Mate, you're back for the 2022 Marco campaign. So how's the season looking and the squad shaping up? Yep, so I'm back, yeah, back for the 22. Oh, that's good. Awesome. It's awesome. They've had a... I've had a good build up. I mean, there's been some um, obviously some good footy of club rugby. So there's a few of those boys, but obviously you see with the Super Rugby and seeing the Tasmanian boys putting their hands up there, a lot of it, and especially around that, like a lot of it with that Moana team, we had a pretty good contingent there. So to see a lot of those Pacific Island boys playing for Fiji, uh, playing for Tonga, Samoa, the like, so for them to get a taste of international footy, obviously it's going to help them with their confidence, but. Once everyone gets back in, it's come. Yeah, I think we're a pretty exciting group, and obviously with two new coaches and and Gray and um, Piggy, I mean uh, they're going to add add a little bit of their own touch to things, and I think it's going to be an exciting year. Fantastic. Hey, Quinton, we really appreciate you joining us. Congratulations on the Premiership. Fantastic effort from you and the boys. And fantastic to hear the background of your time in France, and of course with the Marco and the upcoming season. No, awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, Q, Q Mac, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, you still look like you're only 27, so <laughs> I expect you might be the you might be the first Marco to bring up 150 games away. I don't know going. about that. The grades, the grades are getting a bit, a bit thick. I don't know if that's from rugby or the more kids, but they're getting a bit older now. So. Uh, great to have you on the show. Thanks, no, mate. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Cheers. Fins up, mate. Uh, that's uh, Quinton McDonald, player and coach of Central, the winners of the Stuff Tasman Trophy, and of course hooker for the Tasman Marco. And uh, great guy, what a great oh, guy! Yeah, and and you can sense there's no ego there, right? So here's a here's a man who's the coach of the team, quite happy to be the hooker and let Braden Stewart be the captain and, and run the show yeah. on the field. But also, just when you see QMAC, they call him, uh, around the team and around the staff, always just a genuinely nice man who uh, who engages well with everyone. So he, he is a product of the, the Tasman Mako culture that they talk about, and it's really about being welcoming and having, having fun doing stuff that you love. Quinton McDonald, who play a coach of Central and also Tasman Marco player. The Marco Rugby Roundup. It's the talk of Nelson. Talk Nelson Radio.